Alrighty, now we are live. So welcome everyone. My name is Jalen Radzminski and I'm representing the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. We're super excited for our speakers today and everyone tuning in. We're just allowing a few minutes for people to trickle in. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. And as we wait, I wanted to share an amazing video that was put together by one of Bazelon Center's strategic communications interns, Ludna Pierre. So as we're waiting, I hope you all enjoy this video that I will pull up now. for considering. Here we go. Wow. My nomination as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. America is ready for the Supreme Court last evening to finally shine. And you, Judge Catania Brown Jackson, the person to do it. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, Look I'll rise. why I get emotional. I see my ancestors and yours. Nobody's going to steal that joy. You have earned this spot. Bringing the gift that my ancestor gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. The silence is a quiet in the So thank you to our intern Ludna for creating that beautiful piece. And all right. Well, welcome again, everyone. Again, my name is Jalen Radzeminski from the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. And we are so excited to host this rally to confirm Jackson. And let's see here. Sorry, one moment, there is a technical thing. We're just making sure that it's being streamed on YouTube. Okay, great. I see it. I see it playing on there. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. So hi again. Thanks for your patience, everyone. My name is Jayla Radzeminski from the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, and I'm super excited to host this rally to confirm Jackson. As we're waiting for attendees to trickle in, I hope you all enjoyed the video that was created by our intern, Ludna Pierre. The music was by the artist Andra Day, and the snippets of the poem was from the amazing poet Maya Angelou. We're here to celebrate this historic moment for Katanji, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And before I get into a little bit of what I personally wanted to share with you all today, I wanted to give you all just a quick image description of myself. And all the speakers will do so as well when, when they step up to take the mic. So my name's Jalen. I am a light-skinned Black and Asian person. Um, I identify as disabled. I have long brown curly hair. I'm wearing a blazer as well as a t-shirt that has the Black Disabled Lives Matter symbol designed by our activist, Jen White Johnson. And behind me is a 
green wall along with a black and gold confirmed Jackson poster. Just so thank you all for joining. And as we're here to celebrate this historic moment for Judge KBJ, and I just want to say she will, and speak it into existence, will be the first Black woman to join the Supreme Court. There's a lot to process in this moment and so much to celebrate. And now more than ever, every single voice on the bench makes an incredibly large impact. We've seen Supreme Court cases over disability rights, voting rights, health care, women's rights, voting rights, education, and so much more. And these stakes are high because they impact each and every one of us for our everyday lives. And this is a moment where we're seeing an overqualified Black woman not only have a voice in the room where it's happening, but directly impacting and interpreting the legal system that was historically not created for Black people, for women, and for our disability community. But here we are. Today, here we are. And we still have a long way to go. For those of us who tuned into the hearings last week, I know there is a lot of highs and lows that mirrored how many of us in that are Black women and in the disability community are treated no matter how much we overcome and we overachieve. And as we hold joy today, I know personally from my tweet that accidentally went viral, 131 plus thousand people also agreed that we are sick and tired of the outdated systems and the trauma that comes along with our advocacy amongst Black women in our disability community. And we, and all that we have to endure to step into the power and have the presence that we deserve and to make the history that has been long overdue to us and all of our communities. Black women around the nation are celebrating while simultaneously reflecting on the obstacles and burdens we often are expected to endure, not just in the court settings, right, but in the workplace, boardrooms, commissions, advocacy, and politics. A woman like Katanji Brown Jackson stepping into the highest court in the nation is long overdue, and we need women with a strong record in civil and disability rights and justice, not just at the Supreme Court, but every level of court and every level of leadership. So this is just a start for us and we're excited to keep it going. So I'm excited to share this space with these incredible advocates that are joining us today. You'll hear from peers with lived experiences, legal advocates, black women and overall champions of disability justice. Some of these individuals I work with very, op op work with very often and they pump me up every single day as well as some women that I very much admire and inspire me from afar. And I hope you all will enjoy to hear what they have to say. And we're all excited to rise with KBJ. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Michelle Uzetta from Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, also known as DREDIF. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Jalen. My name is Michelle Uzetta. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a middle-aged biracial woman wearing glasses and a dark red sweater with my hair pulled back in a ponytail. Um, I'm elated to be here today representing the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund in this celebration of the nomination and anticipated confirmation of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. The addition of a justice to the Supreme Court can change its balance and dynamic because Supreme Court justices serve for life and wield such significant power. It's essential that prospective members of the court demonstrate a strong commitment to advancing disability rights and ensuring equal application of the law. Judge Jackson meets these requirements. She actually exceeds these requirements uh, through her judicial record. Judge Jackson has demonstrated an understanding of disability rights laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 and their importance to people with disabilities. She's exhibited a steadfast commitment to the fair and thorough adjudication of disability rights claims and has displayed a commitment to both ensuring that the federal judiciary reflects the diversity of this country 
and to protecting the central role the courts play in the enforcement of civil rights laws. In addition to being the first black woman nominated to the Supreme Court, Judge Jackson is the first nominee to have worked as a public defender. This is significant and it sets her apart from every other sitting member of the court. The experience of defending the constitution and civil rights of individuals from all walks of life, including individuals with disabilities, gives Judge Jackson a keen awareness of and perspective on the barriers such individuals face in accessing justice, a unique understanding of how the existing system is unfair and in need, need of significant change, a perspective that to date has been, let's face it, largely lacking on the high court. Um, Judge Jackson has rendered important and disability rights advancing opinions in areas including education, criminal justice, transportation, and employment. Some of her opinions will be discussed by other speakers you'll hear today. I will note one case of special interest to me as a housing advocate. Last August, Judge Jackson served as part of a three judge panel in a housing case before the DC Circuit Court of Appeal that refused to block the Biden administration's residential eviction moratorium a moratorium specifically designed to keep renters in their homes during the COVID pandemic. Although the decision was later overturned by the Supreme Court, it demonstrated a concern for the rights of vulnerable people, including renters with disabilities who face a disproportionately severe risk of experiencing homelessness and complications from COVID. We need justices at all levels of the judiciary who understand and share these types of concerns. On a personal level, I could not be more excited to witness the barriers being broken by Judge Jackson's nomination. I'll share that in the 30 years I've been a lawyer, I can count on one hand the number of times I've appeared before a judge that looks like me. And this is not an exaggeration. It's been probably three times. Um, when I go to court, more often than not, I'm the only person of color in the courtroom. I've frequently been mistaken for a defendant, the family member of a defendant, a legal assistant, or the personal care attendant of a disabled client. It always comes as a, as a surprise to potential clients, opposing counsel, court staff, and judges that I'm actually an attorney. This can be humiliating and isolating. In California, where I practice, only 4% of active attorneys are Black and 5% are people with disabilities. Both groups are underrepresented when compared to the overall demographics of the state's population. National statistics are just as daunting on race and even worse when it comes to disability. The latest report issued by the American Bar Association revealed that only 5% of the nation's lawyers are black and roughly one half of 1%, one half of 1% of attorneys disclose having a disability it's clear that the representation is grossly inadequate. So while we are here today to celebrate progress made and barriers broken, there's still a ways to go. We need to diversify the courts as well as the legal profession that serves as a pipeline to judicial appointments. I'd like to end my remarks with a fitting quote from Judge Edward Chen of the United States District Court of the Northern District of California. It is the business of the courts to dispense, dispense justice fairly and administer the laws equally. How can the public have confidence and trust in such an institution if it is segregated, if the communities it is supposed to protect are excluded from its ranks? Thank you, enjoy the day. Thank you so much for sharing that, Michelle, and your powerful experience and the importance of having more diversity in the courtroom for us as everyday people, as well as people who are trying to break into the legal profession. So thank you. Next up, we're going to have our next speaker, art activist, Jen White Johnson, whose design I'm actually wearing today. I'm a big fan of hers. And I'm just trying to find you to pin you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. 
<laughs> there you are. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Yes, it is such an honor and pleasure to be present. Um, just a quick image description of myself. Uh, I am an Afro-Latina woman um, with cinnamon uh, brown skin. Um, I'm wearing my favorite pink headband and I have my long highlighted brown curls um, on my shoulders and I'm wearing my, Ed, my, my AirPods and I have the gap in my teeth and I'm wearing one of my favorite sweatshirts by Philo Philadelphia Print um, that says Catalyst for Change, Chisholm for President, 1972. Shout out to um, the great Shirley Chisholm and and I think, and, and I'm actually um, tuning in from Baltimore. And I think that we can all agree that um, it, this is a, a monumental moment. Um, and it means a lot to me as, you know, a woman who identifies as disabled living with ADHD, who uh, also with an autoimmune disorder, um, who is a mother to an autistic son who's nine years old and he's at school today you know, still wearing his mask, you know, in, in Maryland, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we, we forget that our immunocompromised kids are who we are fighting for, our immunocompromised comrades um, in activism, in, in, in art making as a space for social justice um, and transformative justice. And so I'm just super honored to hold space for this nomination and for a human that really uplifts and empowers, you know, folks who are disabled. Um, you know, as we know, we we spend so much time othering, you know, our disability community in the school system, in the in the workplace, in the in creative spaces. And I'm confident moving forward that because I'm seeing myself being represented in the judicial system in the Supreme Court system that I have someone who's advocating on my behalf to make sure that kids like my son who exist as black and autistic can be viewed as, you know, a force who can be viewed as having this fire, knowing that the reason that they're alive walking around is because that they have the support systems in place that are supported by our government, by our communities, by um, you know our citizens, you know we can't say that Black Lives Matter or that Black Disabled Lives Matter without making sure that we're all in this together as as one. Um, so, um, again, moving forward, I'm confident that our disabled students. I'm also a professor at the University of Minnesota, where I um, are where I'm constantly advocating for my disabled students who identify as having invisible and visible disabilities, making sure that they have, you know, perspectives, that they have the agency. Um, and if we don't necessarily see that support reflected in the court system, in our government, in our communities, then where, where does that really leave us? And so this discussion is so important and I'm hoping moving forward that, you know, the court system can really be a place that represents all people, um, all body minds. And so um, some of the, the artwork that I wanted to share today is uh, create more anti-ableist spaces. So I'm shouting out my disability community today, making sure that spaces like the classrooms and university settings and workplaces can be spaces where we feel heard, seen, and, and equal. Um, and Jalen was, was wearing, uh, this is a, uh, a digital illustration of a fist that says Black Disabled Lives Matter that's intersected with the neurodiversity symbol um, representing that, you know, again, we're in this together. Um, we have to remember that this fight, that we don't have to fight alone. Um, and if we can have someone that can represent our perspectives, our desires, um, our policies, like what we truly need, then that's something worth celebrating. So thank you so much for holding space for my little two cents. Um, again, I'm, I'm honored to, to be with everybody today. And, and remember, um, we're in this together and let's continue to, to move forward and to fight for, for folks who feel like they don't have that representation, who feel that they don't have, you know, that, you know, those comrades, um, that backup. Uh, and so as parents, as community advocates, as activists, let's remember who this fight is for.
and 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 let's remember, you know, um, what this is what this is really all about. This isn't just a celebration of one person being confirmed to the Supreme Court justice. This is a celebration for all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jen, just for sharing your art and continuing to create art and awareness for all of the things that our community needs. So thank you. So next up, I'm calling up a dear friend and peer, Vesper Moore. They are one of the leaders of Kiva Centers, as well as Mind Freedom International. So I am bringing you to the stage now. Thank you, Jalen. Um, so just briefly to start up a quick image description of myself, I am a light-skinned brown person, an indigenous person of Taino descent. Um, I am a mad disabled activist, and behind me is a Hopi tapestry with shades of black, brown, red, yellow, and then right next to it is an indigenous rattle. Um, I'm wearing a light blue suit. Um, I have ear weights that are um, black and angular, and I'm sitting in a brown chair. Um, so just to start off, this is a potentially very historic moment um, in United States history, internationally, as we look forward to having proper representation in the Supreme Court. Historically, in a nation that had slave masters and leadership, this is a monumentous occasion. I also want to invite the fact that, that yes, when we talk about designing um, a better future in the inception and creation of policies and law for uh, disabled folk, for people with disabilities, it is crucial that, that, that at the core, we have someone who is a supporter in, in, in every sense, in the sense, and someone who is mutual in the sense of understanding our deepest depressions and sufferings to a certain extent, right? Um, having a Black woman in the Supreme Court as a judge really speaks and rings as a beacon of hope from, from everything that has occurred in this nation. This, th at, at, at this moment, at this juncture, we are seeing an impasse where our nation is truly realizing that there's so much that needs to, uh, first off, be restored, addressed, transformed, healed. We are at discourse with ourselves because the oppression and suffering is truly being seen. And I ask today, confirm someone, confirm Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court, a person who will see that suffering, will understand that suffering. From Judge Jackson's work on, uh, you know, uh, institutions and facilities of incarceration, from Judge Jackson's work and views on the education system, from Judge Jackson's uh, perspectives in, on employment, an opportunity, it has been confirmed that she really stands with us. She stands with us. And I say that coming to you today as, as, as a disabled person of color who in this country has very much experienced an erasure, an unseeing, an, un, an, 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 an unbeing understood, uh, particularly throughout COVID which has been a mass disabling event that has impacted all of us. So from a design justice standpoint, having someone in, again, that inception creation and design, um, someone being at the seat of a power in our government who really stands with us to any capacity will be absolutely important when we talk about transformative approaches to disability rights in this nation, an evolution to disability justice. And when I say disability justice, I mean the intersecting understanding of various identities and the fact that our society is inaccessible to us and that we need to be seen. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Vesper, for sharing that. And just so everyone knows that's tuning in today, we see you, we hear you, and we're ready for the change that we deserve. So thank you, Vesper, for sharing your, your design justice and all of your reflections on how important this moment is. So next up, I wanted to bring up Caitlin Banner from the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. So now I'm gonna just bring you right up here to the, to the virtual stage. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be speaking at today's rally in support of Judge Jackson. My name is Caitlin Banner. I'm a white woman with brown hair that is pulled back into a ponytail messy bun. Um, I'm wearing a green shirt and a navy blue blazer. Um, behind me is a navy blue wall with some pictures and some jewelry that's hanging. I am a deputy direct legal director at the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. The Washington Lawyers Committee envisions, I'll pause until we switch interpreters. Great, I think we're all set. So the Washington Lawyers Committee envisions an equitable society in which the legacy of discrimination has been overcome and there's an equitable application of law and access to justice. Judge Jackson embodies these ideals. She has a distinguished judicial record that demonstrates her commitment to equal justice under the law. Judge Jackson has demonstrated an understanding of disability rights and other civil rights laws and their importance to people with disabilities. During the eight years that Judge Jackson has served on the US District Court for the District of Columbia, she has authored over 550 opinions on multiple areas of law, including on civil rights and disability rights. Her career, as others have stated today, has included being a federal appellate judge, a federal district court judge, a member of the United States Sentencing Commission, and an attorney in private practice, and importantly, also a federal public defender. She demonstrates that she's a public servant. And indeed, when she is confirmed, Judge Jackson will be the only former public defender on the bench. Her work on behalf of individuals facing sentences in court ensures that they received high quality legal representation that's guaranteed under our constitution. Her experience representing people from all walks of life will lend perspective as she interprets the law as a justice at the Supreme Court. There is no doubt that Judge Jackson is highly qualified for the Supreme Court and that she deserves strong bipartisan support from the Senate. I wanna to talk today about what confirming Judge Jackson means for the disability community, and in particular for the protection of the legal rights of people with disabilities in our country. The primary legal vehicle, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is just over 30 years old. The essential elements of the ADA that people with disabilities must have equal access to education, employment, government operations, and all aspects of public life, that people with disabilities should be integrated and not segregated, and that people with disabilities are entitled to reasonable accommodations to ensure that they have that equitable access. Those are constantly being interpreted and shaped by the federal courts. In her time on the federal bench, Judge Jackson has shown a keen appreciation for these principles. The federal judiciary can also open or close the doors of federal courts to plaintiffs who are seeking to vindicate their civil rights. Having a justice like Judge Jackson who is committed to equal access to the courts will help ensure that those doors remain open. As my colleague noted, the pandemic in particular has shown the need for a fair judiciary who will apply these principles of disability justice with rigor. People with disabilities have been excluded from consideration around public health protections. They've been discriminated against as public health care systems have begun to ration care, and they've borne the brunt of the pandemic as it ravaged through prisons, psychiatric institutions, nursing homes, and other places of confinement. Judge Jackson has shown a commitment to fair, thorough adjudication of the legal claims that have come before her, and that includes cases under the ADA and other disability rights and civil rights laws. I wanna highlight two cases today, one of which I've had the pleasure to work on that demonstrate Judge Jackson's judicial approach. 
The first case is a case that I work on on behalf of the Equal Rights Center, along with our co-counsel at Relman Colfax. Um, it is a case against Uber for its failure to provide equitable services to wheelchair users. Last year, Judge Jackson denied Uber's motion to dismiss, clarifying that Uber's ride-sharing application is a covered service under the ADA and the DC Human Rights Act. Judge Jackson's opinion rejected Uber's attempts to evade its obligations under federal and state non-discrimination laws, finding that they could not show that neither the ADA or the DC Human Rights Act applied to its services, and, and thus that they were required to make accommodations to people under the law. She also dismissed attempts to block plaintiffs from bringing their lawsuit in the first place, finding that plaintiffs did not have to experience discrimination before challenging it. Judge Jackson held that a disability rights advocate did not have to engage in what's known as a futile gesture by downloading the app in order to show that it wasn't working for her. This principle applies in many other disability rights and other civil rights contexts. And it's an important ruling for ensuring that people with disabilities and people bringing civil rights claims to the court can have their case heard on the merits. The other case I wanna bring up today is a case in which Judge Jackson ruled in favor of a deaf person incarcerated in the DC jail who was denied access to a sign language interpreter and other accommodations that would have allowed him to access services and programming at the jail. Judge Jackson upheld the purpose and requirements of the ADA that require government entities to be proactive about accommodating people with disabilities stating that nothing in the law remotely suggests that covered entities like a jail or other government operations have the ability to be, or the option, excuse me, to be passive in their approach to disabled individuals as far as the provision of accommodations is concerned. Judge Jackson's strong record on disability rights is a huge benefit to the disability community as she steps hopefully into the Supreme Court. In closing today, I want to emphasize my deep respect for Judge Jackson, my firm belief that her record and history demonstrate a firm commitment to equal rights and equal justice and the rule of law, and my respectful request with all of you that the Senate confirm her as the first Black woman justice at the Supreme Court. Thanks to everybody for um, joining today, and I'm excited to uh, hear the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much, Caitlin, just for sharing your experiences. Um, having a case before her, it's incredible. So thank you. And thank you for all your reflections and your call to action. So coming up next, we have Rianne Henderson, who is here today representing Count Us In. So Rianne, I'm about to, I'm about to welcome you to the stage. Hi, I'm Rianne, and as Jalen just said, I am representing Countess Anne. And just for a quick image descriptor, I am a younger Black woman who is medium or light. I'm a little washed out right now, so I might be looking a little yellow, but I have longer brown, longer Black um, twisted in a protective style hair, which you might see a little blue peeking out. And in the background, I'm just sitting in front of a brown closet with a tan wall to the side and a few clothes on the other hand. And now a little bit about Candace Inn just really quickly. Candace Indiana is a nonpartisan nonprofit who is aimed at uplifting the voices of citizens and creating a diverse and inclusive, inclusive voter turnout by education, empowering and showing that voices matter. And now what I really want to talk about, about the confirmation of Judge Kentaji Brown Jackson is that what it would mean to a younger generation of Black people, a generation even younger than my own. Like growing up, kids are told that they can be anything they want, but then they become teenagers and young adults and they realize that there are barriers to that. They go to college or in the workforce or even in just the world in general and realize that they are the only person that looks like them in the room, not only in regards to race, but gender, religion, and ability. And it's something that's very discouraging. How can we tell little black boys and girls or just any child who encompass a plethora of different identities that they can be anything that they want in this world when there's no representation of that? 
confirming Jackson into the highest court of the nation shows that not only our community, but the entire country that Black success is both real and attainable. To be the first Black woman who truly exceeds any and all qualifications and also has a historic level of bipartisan support, which is well-deserved, is incredible. It's the start of representation by someone who truly cares about diverse populations and will actively work towards equity and accessibility for all, and it's something that has been a long time coming. So going forward, as someone who is interested in the legal field myself, it's something to look up to that I can achieve higher and higher in anything that I set my goals towards. And it's just incredible that younger children, I'm going to speak this into existence, will be able to witness um, Judge Jackson into the highest court and know that they can truly be any and everything they want in this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rianne, for sharing that. And just these reflections on how Judge Katanji Brown Jackson will inspire and uplift the next generation of leaders. So thank you. So next we have coming up Rashira Dobson, who is representing the American Association of People with Disabilities. I've had the pleasure of getting to know her a lot over the past year and a half. So very excited to bring you up to the stage. Hello everyone, hello. Um, I just wanna first start off and say that the comments that we've heard so far from everyone have really just, I think they resonate with anyone who is watching and who will watch um, about why this confirmation is so important. Definitely thank you to Jalen and the Bazelon Center and AAPD for providing this opportunity where we can all share our thoughts and sentiments around the power behind this confirmation. Um, before I start, I want to give a brief image description. I am a brown skinned African American woman. Um, my hair is wavy, long brown, wavy, medium hair. Um, my background is whitish gray with pictures um, on the back. Um, and you might see some other random posters because I'm just a creative person. I like to see things on my wall. Um, but yes, getting into the importance of this confirmation. And when I, when I think about the importance of this confirmation and what that means, not only for the disability community, but for the black community, I, I see the power of intersectionality. I see the power of representation. Um, I'm a person, I'm in the field of public health and I believe in equity. And when I was listening to the other speakers and giving some of the groundbreaking work that she has done on uh, advocacy in the judiciary courts and um, some of her cases that she has just covered in relations to the deaf inmate and making sure that uh, these institutions were held accountable um, in providing um, accommodations for individuals and put in our prison systems to the, the Uber case and making sure that these organizations as well, like I said, are being held accountable for accommodations. I kept on thinking that it is because people like Judge Katanji Black Jackson, um, her represent representation creates a bridgeway for equity. Equity is so important when we're looking at um, how we can move our social justice systems, how we can move our systems forward as a whole is really by providing and lifting up um, more spaces and more spaces to people who look like Judge Brown um, and who have the experiences in the background of Judge Brown and be able to pull her experiences, be able to pull her lens and bring that all into a platform um, and a, a perspective that can really advocate for all American people, whether you are black, brown, um, yellow, whatever color or whatever ethnicity you might relate to, disability status, sexual orientation status, when we have more visibility and representation in these platforms, it really does open the doorway to equity. Uh, I wanna share a personal story. I, I'm currently living in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I remember when our previous mayor, Keisha Lance Boggins was elected as mayor to the city of Atlanta. 
I believe she was also the first black woman to be elected in that position. And there was this meme going around on Twitter, I believe, and it was really hilarious. They're like, wow, we're actually going to have a mayor named Keisha. And even though in that instance, it was really comical, it was really like the fact that people were able to identify to something as simple as a person's name, a person's personhood, who they represented it to them. It really, it opened up the door that not only women like myself who identify as being African-American or who are disabled, um, but it also opened up the door to how normalizing that people like Judge Jackson, who are dark-skinned women who wear dreads, um, who maybe don't come from a very linear path, uh, who are overqualified to be in these positions, who have names that have traditionally been called, quote unquote, um, hard to pronounce. Um, people like her who can occupy um, these spaces, it sets the precedence for future generations um, to come. It lets girls like me who also have other hard, non-white sounding names to say, hey, we actually have permission to be in these places, not only because we're giving an empathy card or a black card, but because we earn it and we deserve it. And I think we've been able to see that from Judge Jackson's, um, her record. Um, even I know a lot of the conversations during the confirmation or the nomination hearings, and a lot of the conversation was surrounding the treatment even of black women in these spaces and how it has taken us this long to get to the space and where we're actually advocating for black women, black women's mental health, and how most times we are put in positions where we have to fight. Um, we have to fight for our personhood. We have to fight for what we look like. We have to fight against things such as colorism um, and things like that. And having Judge Brown, like I said, in this position to be a representation, it, it echoes to what that will say to future generations of not only Black little girls who want to become judges and lawyers, but Black women in general who say, hey, I have a right to occupy this space that has decision-making power and that my qualifications, um, they set the presidents before me, they speak for me. Um, and so I really wanted to uplift uh, that piece of the narrative because I think it's really important that as we know that this is going to be hugely impactful to the disability community, it's also going to be just as impactful for those who identify within those two intersecting identities of disability and those who also identify as being Black or a part of another minority or Indigenous group of people. Um, and so I'm completely honored to just be able to echo some of my sentiments upon what this confirmation will mean. And, um, I, I, I hope that us as a community, we can just take this and go forward with it. And in future to come, we will see a disabled person uh, who sits on the Supreme Court. Um, we will see a disabled Black person, a disabled Hispanic person, because like I said, her, her, um, her trailblazing representation is really going to open up the door for other forms of representation and identities to be um, in these spaces. So thank you. Thank you so much for Shira for sharing those reflections and important aspects of name and culture in this reflection as well. So coming up next is another person I, I also deeply admire, Lydia Brown from the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. So Lydia, I'm I'm finding you to bring you up to the to the virtual stage. Here we go. Hi everyone, this is Lydia XC Brown. My sign name is L Brown. Pronouns are they, them. I'm a youngish East Asian person with short black and teal hair, currently wearing a green polo shirt, black jacket, and a mask over my face because yeah. I am in a public location at the moment. And because COVID is not over, as many of us who are sick and disabled know, and continue to be devastated by its impact. I wanna take a moment to talk about the importance and limitations of representation, as well as what its overarching significant actually is. We've heard a lot today from many powerful and trailblazing black disabled leaders and advocates about the necessity and importance of having an openly, obviously black dark complexion woman being seated upon the Supreme Court. And 
as an East Asian person of color, disabled and trans, I am also extremely excited about that possibility. I also want to talk about what it means to have people who look like us or share our experiences, whether mine specifically or those of my colleagues and comrades who are here today in positions of power. I do not believe, and AWN does not believe, that representation by itself is going to get us to liberation or freedom. Merely having faces that share experiences at marginalized communities is not going to upend centuries of white, of white supremacy, dispossession, settler colonialism, or empire. But who is present in these positions? Who is able to exercise power? Who is able to influence the work of this court and of other institutions in this nation that are responsible for setting legislative, regulatory, or in this case, jurisprudential precedent matters greatly to every one of us who is doing work on the ground in our communities. When we are thinking of who will be appointed and confirmed to such positions, who will be elected to positions of public office, we are thinking about the conditions under which we will be doing our advocacy. What are the conditions under which lawyers doing work for disability rights, for racial justice, for social justice will be undertaking their work? What are the conditions under which community organizers and activists will be undertaking our work? What precedent will be available to us? What language in dissents that a Justice Brown Jackson might write will become available to us? What will her presence change about the way in which the court deliberates, about the way in which the court makes its decisions? What will her experiences, which we've spent a lot of time discussing, particularly her experience as a public defender, a person who is in a position representing communities of people who are largely impoverished, black and brown and disabled, bring to the way in which she approaches cases that come to her on the bench? How can we be pushing for changes to the composition of this court that not only reflect who lives currently in this nation, but that will profoundly impact the conditions under which we are undertaking our advocacy, that will impact the conditions that we are fighting against, because we will keep fighting against racial injustice and white supremacist harms. We will keep fighting against the harms of misogyny and anti-queer and anti-trans oppression. We will keep fighting against the harms of ableism but what will be the conditions of the fight? Who will be present in a position of power to influence the terrain in which we are fighting, to influence the culture that we seek to change? Who will be influencing the ways in which we are able to carry on our work, what strategies we can use, and what means of both harm reduction and work toward liberation? we can take together. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson is of course, beyond eminently qualified for appointment to the Supreme Court. Her presence is also a possibility, represents a powerful possibility for us as folks who are directly impacted by violence, by systems of domination and oppression to keep doing our work in a nation under conditions that will not be determined forever by a small group of almost entirely white men. And that alone is worth celebrating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia, for bringing awareness to that important point, what I often call cosmetic diversity. We need tangible results that will change these systems that we live in every day. So thank you for that and all of your other incredibly important points. So last but absolutely not least, we're really excited to welcome Haben Gurma to the stage. 
Um, she's an incredible disability rights lawyer, author, speaker, and alumni of Harvard. So Hobbin, I'm, I'm working on bringing you to the stage now. Awesome. All right, I got you up here now. Hello everyone, this is Hobbin Grimm as speaking visual description. Behind me is my German Shepherd seeing eye dog on a dog bed. He usually sleeps through my presentations. And up front is me. I'm a black woman with long dark hair. Everyone so far has been providing lovely visual descriptions of where they are how they identify. There has actually been debate and controversy within the disability community, especially the blind community of, should we be providing descriptions of our race? And I thought race doesn't matter or shouldn't matter. And we do dream and hope of reaching a future where we're judged by our merits rather than the color of our skin. That is not America today. And if we deny access to blind individuals of visual representations, visual information that sighted people have access to, that creates room for all the biases, including harmful biases that many of us have. I've been in situations where people, blind people who do not receive visual descriptions assume by my voice that I'm white. And we don't wanna create the spaces for assumptions, especially harmful assumptions. So the fact that our community is doing the work of creating visual descriptions is very exciting, especially in the context of today to support and celebrate Judge Jackson. I'm really excited in particular because I'm a black woman who went to Harvard Law School and was the first deaf blind person to do so. Lots of struggles and barriers there. The barriers were not so much my disability, but ableism, systemic biases against disabled people. The fact that Judge Jackson is a Black woman is exciting personally. But as we've heard earlier, we don't just want superficial representation, superficial cosmetic diversity. We want meaningful diversity. And I want to stress that Judge Jackson is highly, highly qualified. And we've heard some of the disability cases. Her stance that Uber has an obligation to be accessible. And we heard about Pierce versus the District of Columbia. Deaf individuals who are incarcerated should have communication access and disabled people should have a justice in the Supreme Court. We should have multiple justices in the Supreme Court who understand disability rights and believe disabled people should have equal access under the law. You all watching this, participating in this can help move us towards such an America. Call your representatives. Tell your senators to confirm Judge Jackson. And you're received information through email. And I'm sure that'll be more that will follow on how to reach out to your representatives. Because we all need to take action to reach that future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haben, for joining us and sharing those important points of image descriptions, what that means to the community, 
and just your experiences and the cases you highlighted. Thank you so much. I'm honestly starstruck and honored that you're here today and, and we're very grateful for your presence. And I know a lot of people like myself are very eager to do everything we can to, to follow your trailblazing leadership and follow your footsteps. So thank you for joining us and, and sharing this moment with us today. I don't think I could have summarized it better than Haven. So what I can do is just in closing, share, share, share how we can all do our part to take action. So think, thanks to AAPD, we have now a text line where you can actually directly text and reach out to your senator. So if you text confirm KBJ, that's C-O-N-F-I-R-M KBJ with no spaces, to the cell phone number 202-630-2080. You can be able to text your senator to let them know how important it is for you and our community to have Judge Jackson confirmed. And again, that's texting confirm KBJ to 202-630-2080. We have some other ways you can dial in to actually call. Um, I know we're posting on social media and email as well. And the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, along with a lot of incredible individuals and advocates in our beautiful disability community, um, has a sign-on letter to senators. And if you would like to join us in our letter to senators to urge them not only to confirm Jackson, but also amplify how incredibly qualified she is like our community did today um, you can find that link on our social media and we will also be posting it in the youtube link and emailing that out again as well and you can sign up for that on a google form or by emailing me directly at the Baslon center and other ways you can take action um, we have been, the Bazelon Center has been sharing out a research memo. So if you're a big legal or academic nerd that loves to read, um, definitely keep the lookout for that. It goes into depth of the cases we mentioned today and so many more because that's how qualified she is. So we have that material circulating around and everyone is free to share it in the research memo to let the community as well as your representatives know how qualified Judge Jackson is. And finally, um, please continue to engage on social media. You can follow um, the speakers that spoke today, um, the organizations hosting this event to continue to get updates and reflections. And you can post a reflection yourself using the hashtag for this event, hashtag rise with KBJ and also hashtag confirm Jackson and post a reflection of what her nomination to the Supreme Court means to you and because your voice matters as well right so just thank you all for joining us today and sharing community with us today for this incredible historic moment and we hope that we were able to spread joy and passion and further affirm how qualified Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is. The work isn't over, but we're, we're eager to keep doing it. So thank you all. And I hope you have an incredible rest of the day. Thank you.